He was the American magician of the 20th century. He was the quintessential image of, of a magician. He looked like a magician, talked like a magician. To me, Blackstone was always the magician. When he walked out on stage, he owned the audience immediately. And right between the ears came a real, live bunny. Keller once said, Blackstone is the greatest all-around magician I have ever seen. And Blackstone, if Thomas Jefferson were going to be on the stage, it wouldn't have been as thrilling or exciting. Harry Blackstone was a contemporary of Harry Houdini's. Magicians Dante and Thurston were also amongst his peers. Survival in this company was tough, and Harry Blackstone did more than survive, becoming one of the most respected names in magic. But more remarkably, his legacy would endure through the astonishing achievements of his son, Harry Blackstone, Jr. He was the quintessential image of, of a magician. To me, Blackstone was always the magician. When he walked out on stage, he owned the audience immediately. Blackstone personified the ideal magician. His career spanned vaudeville, nightclubs, legitimate theaters, USO shows, and television, with illusions that ran the gamut from the intimate to the spectacular. For many, the image of Harry Blackstone is the magician in tales who mesmerized adults and gave rabbits to children. Harry Blackstone was born Harry Bouton in Chicago in 1885. He and his younger brother Pete worked for a cabinet maker. It was an experience that would later prove invaluable for two young men embarking on a career in magic. According to family lore, Harry saw a performance of renowned magician Harry Keller at the McVickers Theater in 1897. Watching the master magician, Harry Bouton knew he had found his calling. At the turn of the century, magicians were in great demand as vaudeville entertainers. To gain access into this world, Harry and Pete developed a novelty act. They started out, before the turn of the century, putting together a magic act. The first act they put together was one called Straight and Crooked Magic, where Pete would burlesque the magic and Harry would do it seriously. This went on for quite a while until Pete decided he really did not want to be the performer. He enjoyed the technical things more. Traveling across America, Harry began developing larger and more elaborate illusions. But money was still tight enough that when it came to naming the act, he was willing to be flexible. He purchased a discounted batch of pre-printed posters for a magician named Frederick the Great. To Harry's great benefit, Frederick had already overextended his credit with the printer. So he was able to buy this paper of Frederick the Great very inexpensively. However, his timing was impeccable. We had just gone to war with Germany. If you can change your name, I have 26 weeks of immediate bookings, Harry's agent told him but you've got to get another name. After that evening's performance, Harry, his wife Inez, and Pete mused over the problem. They needed a name that was readily identifiable, could be seen at a distance. And he said, you know, I need a name that if you're in a train and it's going 40 miles an hour and you see a sign, that the sign is readable, and they saw the cigar sign of Blackstone Cigars. He said, that's it, I'm Blackstone. The new name was a hit. 
By this time, his show was full of grand theatrical style, featuring up to 10 assistants. And over the next 20 years, Blackstone would develop his trademark illusions, such as the buzzsaw routine seen in this 1944 performance. In order to stop the in this next operation of mine, I will use hypnotism, as I am about to saw a little lady in two, in the same manner I saw that piece of wood. So help me. <laughs> In addition to the grand operatic tone of the buzzsaw routine, Blackstone perfected the floating light bulb trick, along with his trademark illusion, the dancing handkerchief. He first brought the handkerchief to life around 1918 and would include it in his act for the rest of his life. Well, first of all, he came down and borrowed a handkerchief. It may not seem like much today, but he took the handkerchief from somebody in the audience, tied a knot in it, and put it in a box, and then the handkerchief came out of the box and danced on stage, and it was known as Blackstone's dancing handkerchief. It was a marvelous effect. Blackstone was different. The shows were a cross between subtle simplicity and the wildly theatrical. But beyond illusions, Blackstone had something every star performer needs, tremendous stage presence. Everyone who saw him remarks on his powerful voice and his memorable appearance. Blackstone had this great head of white hair and this great manner on stage and the voice, which is so important. It wasn't the guy who looks mysterious and then when he talks, um, sounds like you're, you're dentist or something with a mid, from the Midwest. And all the time we toured all over the country in various auditoriums and theaters. Never once did we ever use amplification. He was the last of the old school performers who knew how to project from here out to the back row and have everyone in the theater hear him. You're riveted to his every move, wrote one reviewer. And within the magic community, he was always breaking new ground. Still in his mid-30s, he was one of the top touring acts in the United States lauded across the country and winning praise from the man who had inspired him, master magician Harry Keller. Keller once said on seeing Blackstone in a performance, Blackstone is the greatest all-around magician I have ever seen, which is interesting. Um, and I think what he meant by that was Blackstone could do small magic, you know, the intimate magic. He could uh, work the big illusions and yet relate to the audience in, in all of those different uh, uh, types of magic. There were many magicians of that generation, but Blackstone belonged to an elite group. Another was Harry Janssen from Copenhagen, Denmark, who went under the stage name of Dante. Dante was a greater perfectionist in his magic, but Blackstone has more warmth with the audience. There was also Thurston, 
Keller's protege. Thurston was smooth, polished diction, where Harry was a, more or less down to earth, like a labor type with his voice, no, not with his performance. His hands in the world were, were very good. But ha Harry had uh, advantages. He had a, a way with the kids and with the audience that uh, when he get people on the stage, he just had the way of making them love him. Another competitor was the man whose name was synonymous with magic, Harry Houdini. Of Houdini, Blackstone would only say, we're friendly enemies. One of Houdini's new escapes was the packing box escape. He would have himself be put in a packing box. The packing box would be padlocked, and then he would have himself lowered into a river. Uh, he did it in the East River in New York City. Some other magicians have claimed to be the originators of the packing box escape. The most famous one is Harry Blackstone. Blackstone claimed to have originated the packing box escape before Houdini did, and they got into a big, big quarrel about it. And Blackstone said, but I was doing it while he was in Europe. I created it, I was doing it, here are the newspaper clippings, and in fact, the piece is still in storage in New York. But apparently the Blackstone packing box was not stored in New York. Years later, when magician Joe Dunninger went to buy some books from Mrs. Harry Houdini, she gave him an old trunk in which to place the books. But while carrying it, or dragging it as the case may be, down the stairs, a small trap door opened. And here was the plaque, this little brass plaque, that said, property of Pete and Harry Bhutan, underwater box escape. I tend not to believe that story. I, I can't imagine. I mean, certainly Houdini himself wouldn't have. He wasn't a thief. He was a very straight guy, and he wouldn't have stolen the packing crate and put it in his, put it in his cellar. But who knows? Yeah. You know? Houdini's death in 1926 left the magic world devastated, but it also allowed greater room in the public affection for younger magicians. Soon, however there was another threat on the horizon. Hollywood had already made a serious dent in vaudeville's popularity, but for many, the death knell came with the advent of talking pictures. Instead of fighting the enemy, Blackstone embraced it. And he came to the Paramount Theater with a one-hour show that played four or five, to, on weekends, five times a day with a movie. If anything really inspired me to love magic, it was Blackstone. By the late 1930s, Harry Blackstone was on top. His old rival, Thurston, had passed away in 1936, and Dante had devoted his time almost exclusively to touring Europe. Within the world of magic, it seemed like the United States belonged to Harry Blackstone. He had no way of knowing that many of the best days were behind him. It was the Omaha World Herald, and a lot of people took that paper in Lincoln, and I was looking through movie listings, and suddenly, Blackstone, and I thought, that's the name of a hotel, but this looks like, no, there's his picture. It's an ad. It's, it can't be. He's coming to Omaha in my lifetime. By the early 1940s, he was one of the leading lights in American magic, his name a trademark for young and old alike. I could not comprehend that in the immediate future, I was going to be sitting perhaps in a seat in a theater and Blackstone, if Thomas Jefferson were going to be on the stage, it wouldn't have been as thrilling or exciting. And I'm going to give this rabbit away. In fact, I'm going to give the first boy or girl that says I. Who ah! like the, the stage shows, over, now performed around, between around. movies, had become a staple for audiences across the country. A charming trademark, as seen in this 1950s footage, was giving a rabbit to a child in the audience at the end of his vanishing rabbit routine. During his career, he gave away some 153,000 bunnies. You did it. What? I don't know, but you did it. But go on. And you're to blame. You're a rabbit squeezer. She was about to go to her seat. She said, well, where's my rabbit? 
forgetting that she is squeezed it. She was a squeezer. What a magician do we pick the paper of? He said, I'll make a paper rabbit. And he started to make a paper rabbit, saying this. This is the tail, the tail of a rabbit. And he started to put ears, paper ears, on a paper rabbit. And while making the ears, he turned to the young lady and he says, young lady, what kind of ears do you wish? And what do you think she said? Real ears. Real long ears. That's exactly what she said. And right between the ears came a real, live bunny. Then he gave the bunny to the young lady, and she lived happily ever after. And I'm giving you this rabbit. The rabbits, like all the animals here. used by the Blackstone troop, were cared for and housed during the summer in Colon, Michigan. Blackstone's adopted hometown. He first saw the lakefront property in 1925. He and his first wife, Inez, had seen it and thought it was so wonderful, so they bought this land, built the house, made the cottages, and this was the summer home for the show. It was there that Harry, his brother Pete, and right-hand man Ted Banks planned each new season. And just a few miles outside of Colon, his son, Harry Blackstone Jr., was born in 1934. He was the only child of Blackstone and his second wife and assistant, Billy Matthews. But the marriage didn't last, and they were divorced in 1942. With war on the horizon, the mock seriousness of tuxedo magic would become quaint and almost embarrassingly frivolous. Then in September 1942, an event transpired that heralded the beginning of the end. Blackstone was performing at the Lincoln Theater in Decatur, Illinois, when Ted Banks interrupted his act to tell him there was a fire raging next door. The theater was in danger of burning down. And Harry Sr. said to the audience, I have an illusion that's so large, you can't see it from inside the theater. So you're going to need to get up, go outside, and go across the street and look up to the top of the theater, and then you'll be able to see it. Harry Blackstone saved 3,200 people that day and managed to salvage his props, which his production team pulled out of the ever-increasing smoke. Standing beside Harry, watching the fire burn, was Ted Banks, his closest friend and associate. The exertions of dealing with the fire and moving heavy boxes from the theater had a terrible impact. That night, Ted Banks died of a heart attack alone in his hotel room. During the war, Harry Blackstone performed in USO shows at 165 military posts. Gone were the grand palaces and legitimate theaters. By the time the war ended, Blackstone's large-scale tours were a luxury and suffering from lagging box office. And there was also new competition, television. Television had a devastating impact. The grand traveling magic show was dying. During the 1950s, Blackstone continued touring, but with a smaller, scaled-down show. Then, in the 1950s, he began doing short routines on television. The three to eight minute segments were used as filler if live television programs ended earlier than planned. Television had changed live entertainment and Harry Blackstone's world forever. We fade to black and a few years later I've gotten off a train to go to, uh, from Nebraska to go to Yale and I, my parents allowed me a few days in New York and I walked over to Times Square and bang, there's Blackstone standing in front of the palace, sons too contrived, looking at it with a cane. And he's it, just, he's got a cane and, and, and there's no doubt who it is. And I keep thinking, you idiots, well, this is Blackstone, you're walking right past him. I said, what, how, what are you doing these days? And he said, loafing. And I said, I got your autograph in Omaha. Um, and he wished me luck. Harry Blackstone decided to head west, though this time on a more permanent footing. He moved into an apartment in Los Angeles, not far from the headquarters of the Academy of Magical Arts, the Magic Castle. For Harry Blackstone, it was the return to a home he'd never had, the Magic Castle was a mecca for magicians, 
and he was able to spend time with the grand old men of the trade, as well as the young up-and-coming conjurers. In this company, he was an icon. And I remember when people came here and they saw Harry Blackstone, when they saw him sitting there, they were so impressed, and he was Harry Blackstone, and uh, he had a wonderful time. Harry Blackstone's health deteriorated, and in 1965, he died, a professional performer for almost 60 years. He was one of the most successful magicians who'd ever lived. His trademark illusions have become legendary, but Harry Blackstone had not finished making his contributions to the art form. There was something he had left behind. Harry did fight very hard not to go into magic, but every time he tried fighting, summer vacations, he'd wind up taking two weeks off from whatever job he had and would work Las Vegas, or he'd work a magic convention, or these times when he'd say, no, I'm not going to do magic because I don't really want to compete with my father and the legend that he is. I think that when my father died, said Harry Blackstone Jr., that magic began to take on a special meaning for me that I had not experienced through all the years with him. Neither could have imagined how far Harry Jr. would take his father's magic in the years to come. Harry Blackstone Sr. was one of the most important magicians of his time. Harry Blackstone Jr. would become one of the most important magicians of his time, but what makes this something more than the story of a son following in his father's footsteps is that Harry Jr. would not commit to magic until after his father's death, when Harry Jr. was in middle age. And surprisingly, he would choose to do many of the illusions from his father's act, yet with extraordinary style and grace, his achievements in magic surpassed even those of his father. He had all of the charisma of his dad, plus he had other things as well. He brought his father's magic to a new generation and was able to take the classics that the Blackstone family had established and dust them off and, and put them right on Broadway. You couldn't beat Harry Jr. I loved the man. As one of the top magicians of his era, Harry Blackstone Sr. spent the war years performing in USO shows. In his 50s, he realized that the days of grand touring shows and the spectacular magic that had long been his specialty were becoming a thing of the past. The 1940s marked the beginning of the end for Harry Blackstone. It also, however, marked the appearance of a young assistant, his son, Harry Blackstone, Jr. He had been born to Harry's second wife, Billy Matthews Blackstone, in 1934 in Three Rivers, a town not far from Colon, Michigan, where his father's troop always prepared for the next season. He was on stage at five and a half months, tax deductible, as he later put it. He was educated at various boarding schools and military academies, but the rest of the year was spent with his father. Magician Les Smith, a lifelong friend of Harry Sr.'s, first met Harry Jr. after one of his father's shows. And he was taking off his makeup and the big mirror in front of him, you know, with the average lighted mirror. And in the mirror, in the doorway, showed up a lad very nice looking young lad with a military uniform on. Harry looked. You little son of a bitch, what are you doing here? Now leave that out. But that's what he said. You can say son of a gun. And <laughs> he's, you're supposed to be in school. <clears throat> I tapped Harry in the shoulder and says, take it easy, Harry. The boy would rather be with you. That shows his love for his dad and being in military school. Harry calmed right down then, Harry Sr. That's the first time I ever saw Harry Jr. And I liked the boy instinctively. Even at that age, he had that air about him, the, the gentlemanly air, the, the caring. I don't know what it is, but Harry, Harry Jr. to me, 
was always a gentleman. I first saw Harry Blackstone Jr. when we were rehearsing for the opening of the 1950 season. We were at the Davidson Theater in uh, Milwaukee, and there's this young boy playing down there the organ in the orchestra pit. And I said to someone, who's that rascal running around down there? And they said, that's Harry Jr. He was a little hugging backstage when he was young. And uh, his brother Pete, Harry's senior's brother Pete, used to have to lock him in the dressing room to keep him from messing things up just before the show, because Pete would get hell for anything that was messed up. Harry Jr. did not have a traditional childhood. Unusually, his father was given custody of the boy after Harry Sr. and Billy Matthews Blackstone divorced in 1942. And Harry Jr. would spend Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter on the road with his father. And to him, holidays were always hotels because Christmas was always in a hotel and it was with the entire company and the Christmas tree in the hotel room and the presents that were under the tree and the different restaurants that you would visit and the people that you'd remember. Though Harry Jr. grew up around magic and often assisted his father, he was reticent to follow him in a career on stage. He opted instead for first the army, where he learned to read and write Chinese, and then broadcasting as a radio announcer and later a television producer. Harry did fight very hard not to go into magic, but every time he tried fighting, summer vacations, he'd wind up taking two weeks off from whatever job he had and would work Las Vegas, or he'd work a magic convention, or these times when he'd say, no, I'm not going to do magic because I don't really want to compete with my father and the legend that he is. Despite a move to California, Harry Blackstone Sr.'s health was failing. Years on tour and in dusty theaters had taken their toll. In 1965, Harry Blackstone Sr. died. He had been a professional performer for almost 60 years. I think that when my father died, said Harry Blackstone Jr., magic began to take on a special meaning for me that I had not experienced through all the years with him. Soon, he would make a commitment to magic and try to strike out on his own. One of Harry's first professional engagements was in Dallas, where he worked on a news program. After that, he did uh, Mr. Peppermint, a children's television show. I was a child and watched him on Mr. Peppermint. But Harry Jr.'s most successful association was with Tom and Dick Smothers, the Smothers Brothers. In the 1960s, Harry Jr. served as associate producer of their television show, which was followed by a Las Vegas review. Its success led to Harry's decision to dedicate himself to magic. After two marriages and now a burgeoning new career, Harry Blackstone Jr. was not interested in becoming entangled. But in 1970, he met Gay Blevins in the office of magic entrepreneur Milt Larson. The first time I ever met Harry was in a meeting in Milt Larson's office, and he was sitting in this very large, old uh, barber chair. And my first response of looking over at him was, he's gorgeous. And then I started listening to him talk, and I thought, he's also bright. And that was not what I had thought of previously with most magicians. Those were not the words that typically came out of your thought process. We got married in 1974, and I didn't want to. We had been together at that point for like two, two and a half years. And I said, you know, I don't really want to get married. And he said to me, it's not good for business. It's not good for business? What a romantic thing for someone to say. So we got married in Las Vegas on Sunday night. We stayed over Monday, came back Tuesday morning, and went immediately to the Merv Griffin Show, where we announced to the world that we had just gotten married. And much to our accountant's thrill, I did an illusion where my hand was showing, and therefore that made the ring tax deductible. During that time, Harry Jr. was performing everywhere, from amusement parks to colleges to playboy clubs. This is a, a bird in a cage, a canary. And, and while you watch, the canary will disappear. Disappear. Just like that. Now, people all over the world have asked me many times, how do you do it? Rather well is the answer, of course. You sometimes would take on jobs that, you know, 
would uh, make it very hard for him to get rehearsal time and things would go wrong. He only carry it off as a showman in the centre. <laughs> been surrounded by magic, but he came to it late. It had been so much a part of my life, he said, that perhaps I didn't recognize it as the unique and marvelous art that it is. The sights and sounds of it were with me. The musty black velvet curtains, the smell of gunpowder for the cannon trick, white satin and ostrich feathers. Yet the wonder of the magic itself had perhaps eluded me. In his 40s, he became both an aficionado and master of the art. The story of a child surpassing a successful parent is not unusual in show business. The fascinating thing about, about Harry was how he brought his father's magic to a new generation and was able to take the classics that the Blackstone family had established and, and dust them off. One of Blackstone's trademark illusions was the dancing handkerchief. A staple in Harry Sr.'s act since 1918, it was also extremely popular with Harry Jr.'s audiences. show and I closed my eyes and I knew every word of the show. The pattern was burned into my mind, every piece of music, every nuance of, the, of his father's show. And Harry did his father's show word for word, trick for trick, only with updated costuming. And I, you could close your eyes and hear his father. He had the same voice as his father. And, and it brought tears to our eyes. He had the charisma. He had all of the charisma of his dad, plus he had other things as well. He had poise and he had breeding. His father at times could be a bit uncouth. I never saw Harry Jr. be uncouth. I never saw him when he didn't have complete command of his audience. Harry was a little down to earth, if and then and those and those. I mean, he was just a down to earth guy, a self-educated person, a senior where Harry Jr. was very polished. Everything he spoke was very proper, and his diction was good, and that made, in my opinion, made him superior to his father. The best of, 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 of Harry Blackstone Jr. was even better than some of the things that his father did. Amongst magic aficionados, the rallying point in the argument of father over son is the floating light bulb illusion, seen here performed by Harry Blackstone Sr. in the late 20s. The floating light bulb, as done by Harry Blackstone Jr., is, is one of the greatest effects I've ever seen in my entire life in magic. I mean, it was a fine piece of magic in his father's show, but it was one of the greatest pieces of magic of all time in Harry Jr.'s show. What Harry added was the light bulb not only floated around the stage, but it floated over the footlights and out over the heads of the audience, and then returned to the stage and through the hoop that Harry was holding. It was one of those effects that always got an ovation. It was a great, great piece of magic. He did his father's show better than his father. Harry Blackstone Jr.'s dream was to do a show on a scale unprecedented since his father's shows. But in the 1970s, an age of huge union and trade costs, it was viewed as folly. Blackstone, one critic wrote, doesn't seem to understand that people just don't put on traveling shows like that anymore. Harry set out to prove them wrong. 
He did so with a company of 29 assorted livestock, including a Bengal tiger and a 6,500-pound elephant. Described as the largest and most spectacular traveling magic show ever, the plan was to take the extravagant show and incredible costumes to Broadway. One of Harry's many quiet little suits. It's nice to be in the chorus. Silk, Chinese, pure silk. Something quiet and all American. Show business tradition dictates opening a show on Broadway before going on tour. In this case, Blackstone took the show on the road first, and then, in 1980, brought it to Broadway, where a large-scale magic show was daunting. Well, because no one had ever had a successful Broadway show of magic. There had been shows on Broadway, like the magic show, that had magic in them, but they were still a book show. Very definitely a book show, not a variety magic show. With 118 performances, it became the longest-running straight magic show in Broadway history. Harry Blackstone had, with his own style, grace, and panache, created a show and a success beyond anything his father could have imagined. Yet, ironically, he did it by advancing his father's innovations. As his success grew, Harry Blackstone Jr. became comfortable with his accomplishments and the legacy of Harry Blackstone Sr. He had four daughters, Cynthia, Adrienne, Tracy, and Bellamy, a happy marriage and a job that allowed time for his family. Summer holidays were still spent in Colon, Michigan, where he had grown up. Family also got in on the act. He was definitely a performer above a magician because it was what he loved more. And of course he loved the magic because it was, it was the forum that, that got him there. But I think the performance aspect of it is so important to its showmanship. It's letting people son, enjoy the what box, they're okay. seeing. Young lady right here, what is your first name? Bellamy. Bellamy, you put your hand on the side of the cage. Right on mine. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> the other young lady, you put your hand over here on this side. That's fine. Put your hand right up there. You each have a hand up there, touching it, feeling it, knowing that it's there. Now put another hand on the opposite side of the cage. And you pop. Well, that's the way it goes. Thank you very much. During the 1980s, he would travel the world, introducing his own brand of magic to an audience who likely never knew of his famous dad. Yet through their astonishment, the art of Blackstone Sr. lived on. We've also done Sri Lanka, Goa, Bombay, Frankfurt, Singapore, the light bulb transcended all languages, all locations. But wherever Blackstone went and whatever transpired, the stage always felt like home. One night, it was a very strange audience. So Harry started the show. First illusion went fine, second illusion. And at that point, Harry then put in a piece in one. Now, in one is something that Harry would do in front of the curtain just by himself. He did that, so we were all listening because that wasn't what was supposed to be. And at that point then, instead of going into the next illusion, he skipped and went to an illusion that was too beyond. Well, we're scrambling to change costumes because it's a whole different period. We've changed costumes, we're ready, and at that point, Harry realizes but he just looked down at the notes wrong, and he goes back to the illusion that we were supposed to be going to. And it, we hear this, so once again, we are scrambling, they are lifting props, they are moving props. I mean, backstage, it was like this Chinese fire drill was happening. The Blackstone name will always stand as the trademark for the showmanship of magic. He is, was the last of the traditional magicians wearing a tuxedo, wearing his top hat, and doing um, uh, that wonderful brand of magic. Harry, uh, bright, educated, um, wonderful man to listen to. He handled the show in a very professional way, and I never saw a man on stage who could take uh, control of awkward moments. He was great for that. You couldn't beat Harry Jr. I loved the man. 
Harry Blackstone Jr. died on May 14, 1997, from a sudden illness. He was 62. He left behind his wife Gay and four daughters, and a world of wonders that amazed millions. The odyssey of two generations of Blackstones has ended. The curtain has closed in, and the last Blackstone has come home to be with his dad. Many have said that he was the final link to the era of classical stage magic. The audience at the Abbott's Magic Get-Together in Colon, Michigan, know what the Blackstones brought to magic. Harry Sr. first moved here in 1925, and Harry Jr. grew up here and returned to perform many, many times. At this moment, all I can truly say is, the era has changed. We'll never see Harry dance the hanky or float the light bulb. But that doesn't mean that you won't see a Blackstone not doing it. This summer, for the first time, Bellamy Blackstone did her version of the dancing hanky, which she did as a tribute to both her grandfather and to her father. The Maskelins uh, were a magic family. The mysterious and magnificent Maskelin family, their illusions are still being performed today. I think it's impossible to calculate the, the importance that had on magic. The Maskelins were magic's great designers, builders, and performers, from levitations to mechanical men known as automatons. Many of the great effects come from the Maskelins. From razor blade eating to illusions that caused the Suez Canal to disappear. We call it the golden age of magic. The masculines are still with us. illusion is one of the staples of modern magic. The concept is so simple and so appealing that it doesn't need words, 
just an audience to sit and watch and wonder. The notion of man recreating himself out of machine parts is centuries old. In the Victorian era, small mechanized figures that could play chess and cards seemed to fulfill the prophecy. The notion of being able to transform oneself, to literally be placed in a cocoon and emerge in another form, is a concept as old as recorded time. And yet, in the 1880s, audiences were able to see this every night. perfection of these illusions, the point at which they went from fantasy to reality, the point at which they became part of the magician's trunk of illusions, rests with one family. The Masculines. To the general public, their name is largely unknown, but to the magic community, they were titans. Their specialty was the mechanics of magic, the creation of new effects and illusions. This standard was set by the family's founder, the remarkable John Neville Maskelyne. The Victorian era, a time of propriety, yes, but also a time of growth and expansion. Technological innovation was changing the way people lived and the way they worked. And in that time, in the city of London, was a theater dedicated to magic. And presiding over that theater was a magician named John Neville Maskelyne. Magicians today revere him. Well, John Neville Maskelyne, an Egyptian hall, I think it's impossible to calculate the, the importance that had on magic. The mascot moth, for instance, was uh, one of the great illusions. Maskelyne's greatest contribution to magic by far were the levitations that he introduced. A will and the witch uh, illusion is one of the classic ones of magic. They developed illusions that we're still kind of catching up to today. The theater is called Egyptian Hall, and it's the setting of the story of the Masculine Dynasty. In the 19th century, the 300-seat theater became one of the few venues devoted solely to magic. And our main protagonist, John Neville Maskelyne, would create almost all of his astonishing technical marvels out of this one venue. A British watchmaker by trade, he was fascinated by magic at an early age. At 25, he started performing working with close friend and cabinet maker, George Alfred Cook, who later became his chief builder and backstage designer. Their careers began in 1865, when the two men caught a London performance of the Davenport Brothers. The Davenport Brothers were astounding audiences with their spirit cabinet illusion, a paranormal act which involved the brothers being tied up by members of the audience and placed inside a cabinet. They would be tied together uh, in this cabinet, the curtain would be pulled, and then all sorts of manifestations would mysteriously come from the cabinet. Banjos would be strummed, tambourines would go flying, their shirts would come off. It was a great trick, it was a great illusion. The Davenport brothers were not above suggesting that special powers might be responsible for the illusion. Something of a skeptic, Maskelyne was curious about their outrageous claims. On March 7th, 1865, Maskelyne was part of the audience at a Davenport show. At one point, Maskelyne was called to the stage as an audience volunteer to examine the trick while it was going on, this, to be part of the committee that looked around uh, the, the cabinet. The story goes, and, and I believe it to be a true story, is that the curtain at one point sort of bellowed out, and Maskelyne got a quick look inside the Davenport's cabinet, and he realized they had used a fake rope tie. The brothers obviously did not have special powers. Maskelyne decided to debunk their supernatural claims by building his own spirit cabinet and incorporating the same illusion into his own act. This revealing duplication gave Maskelyne his first big publicity. The Davenport brothers uh, were uh, rage of the age uh, when they were touring the world, and uh, uh, Masculine got a lot of press out of uh, so-called duplicating or exposing uh, the methods they were using. 
As a result of this success, Masklin and Cook soon became a strong enough act that they opened at London's Egyptian Hall in 1873. Originally booked for three months, they would stay for 31 years. The Masklins uh, had a, a perfect uh, place to, to work and play. I mean, they, they could build all day long and try out all their experiments and they present them to their audience at night. It was not only the show place for magicians, for great magicians, but it was a laboratory for great magicians. It brought them to London and it allowed them to flourish, it allowed them to experiment. It put different types of magic in front of an audience. Maskelin quickly grew into the role of magician designer, but during this exuberant period, his love of mechanics was not limited to magic. The new headliner, general manager, designer, and publicist of Egyptian Hall also found time to invent an early typewriter, a theater money changer, and a pay toilet lock. This age of ingenuity and industry suited Masklin and Cook perfectly. I think we still don't know today what part Cook played in the proceedings. He certainly worked as an assistant and, and was probably a very important assistant. He was a partner of Masklin in their early shows when they were working independently, and I think Masculine kept him on as a, as a partner in that sense. But while Cook was content to exist in the wings, there was another power at Egyptian Hall who took center stage. Masculine found another partner in the charismatic magician and designer, David Devant. Magicians agree it is impossible to retell the story of Masculine or Egyptian Hall without discussing David Devant. Well, David Devant is remembered today, I think, as England's greatest magician, and, and I think might be more representative to say one of the greatest magicians of the world, period. He was a remarkable person. He was a remarkable all-around magician, uh, one of the last all-around magicians. He was an entrepreneur. He was an impresario. He was a designer. He was a sleight-of-hand artist. He was a very talented writer, uh, inventor, and What's great about Devant is also the warmth with which he's remembered by audiences. He was, he was kind to people. He treated the audience with respect. He uh, uh, was inviting to children. It was an elegant, sophisticated approach filled with warmth and humor, and the magic was absolutely sensational. With David Devant, introduced to the masculine show and, and to, in, in large measure to magic was the notion of the sort of jovial comedy performer. Uh, there were posters that Devon produced with people, just pictures of the audience just laughing. Masculine was by all accounts an interesting performer to watch, but basically he was exhibiting his devices, he was exhibiting his creations. And Devant was kind of weaving the spell. He really brought it to a new audience and made it theatrical showplace that it hadn't been before. David Devant, uh, he, he came up with so many wonderful ideas that are still used today. Um, something called the mascot moth that he and Masculine kind of worked on together, but was basically a David Devant idea. The illusion in which the magician makes his assistant vanish into thin air astonished Edwardian audiences and had an enduring impact Today, Las Vegas superstar Lance Burton pays homage to the masculine era and performs a variation on the original mascot moth. David Devon came up with many, many things that are still used today. And uh, we're always trying to, to find out how he did uh, certain things. Masculine and Devant would work together for 22 years, but in the early years, the 1860s, it was Masculine who introduced the illusions, specifically one that was to change the rules of magic and change the magician's repertoire for all time. The illusion is called the levitation. Since its introduction, every magician has put their own spin on it, but the basic premise and method of execution belongs with John Neville Masculine. Masculine introduced the levitation, which is very much akin to 
the popular modern day levitation in which a, a woman, generally a woman assistant, uh, floats above the stage, a hoop can be passed over her, uh, and it's, it's truly a remarkable trick. But while the levitation thrilled Victorian audiences, Maskelyne wanted to go further. He wanted to do more with the illusion. In 1876, he designed a way to do just that. Maskelyne would walk to the end of the stage and simply standing there, just fly. He also introduced a 22-inch tall mechanical figure named Psycho, whose appearance caused nothing short of mayhem. John Neville Maskelyne's innovation introduced audiences at Egyptian Hall to spirit cabinets and levitations, but nothing would match what followed. Probably he, his greatest introduction would be uh, automatons. In 1875, Victorian audiences would be astounded by Maskelyne's first automaton. His name was Psycho. Generally speaking, uh, an automaton is uh, a mechanical figure that uh, emulates life human form or animal, birds, uh, whatever. The notion of a card-playing automaton was first suggested to Maskelyne by an English farmer named John Algernon Clark. Maskelyne worked for two years on the project, and in 1875, his design was brought to life. When Maskelyne presented him on stage at the hall, it caused an immediate sensation. You can see now what an amazing fascination that was for an audience. Um, in the Victorian age, when machinery was glorified, when machinery, for the first time, was appearing to give the answers to problems, when it was making life easier, when it was, when the machine itself was a beautiful thing, it was made in brass and wheels, and it was, it was an elegant object. Certainly for an era on the edge of efficiency before the popular use of electricity in automobiles, Psycho would be astonishing. It was truly a miraculous trick. Uh, some truly great magic minds took a look at Psycho and tried to figure out uh, what its workings were, including one magician who uh, probed it with a, uh, a compass, a very strong magnetic compass, and thought he had figured out the secret, but he was completely off. Today, magic designer and builder John Gaughan can give us a glimpse into the wonders of the past. He restored magician Harry Psycho. Keller's version of Masculine Psycho and can demonstrate the performance of a Victorian automaton. What is the answer to five times five, please? Oh, he's very fast. He's thinking. And I believe, yes, he's picked the two. One more card, Psycho. And the five, 25. Very good. Masculine would go on and create further automata, notably Zoe, an automaton that drew pictures of celebrities. In 1876, Masculine then premiered The Levitation Extraordinary. It was a primitive illusion by today's standards, but at the time, it was a sensation. Masculine would walk to the end of the stage and simply standing there, just fly. He would take off and float around the uh, upper reaches of the theater. Uh, audiences could see his body pass around the balconies and, and zoom around like a bird. Uh, I think today's audiences would be unlikely to be fooled by the particular optical effects that Masculine chose to use for that effect, but at the time, it was, it was something. Maskelyne was able to create this effect by virtue of the fact that he was always on the cutting edge of innovation. He had discovered and utilized one of the latest pieces of technology, the Magic Lantern, an early version of the slide projector. The use of this kind of cutting edge technology in creating the levitation extraordinary points up Maskelyne's genius, an ability to tap into man's age old fantasies, desires and wants using the latest in mechanical means.
1886, another member of the Maskelyne family appeared at Egyptian Hall. The eldest son, Neville Maskelyne, performed at the theater for the balance of the incredible run until 1905. Maskelyne's younger son, Archie, appeared in 1904. The Maskelynes uh, were a magic family. Uh, there were a number of magic families at that time. I think the family structure uh, gave way or, or lended itself to uh, magic being passed on. Magic was largely an apprenticed art. It was an art of secrets, and if you're not going to trust your secrets to your family, uh, it seems unlikely that you trust it to an outsider. Film was the next big fad, and the Maskelynes jumped right in. Like his contemporaries, the Lumiere brothers, Neville began experimenting with the new medium in the last years of the century. At the same time, magicians like George Méliès were already making names for themselves by mixing magic with the new medium. The golden age of magic was a mix of gentility and ingenuity, innovation and exuberance. Most citizens believed that a man might very well be able to go around the world in 80 days, or at least cross the ocean in five, or even fly. That world disappeared in 1914. World War I would shatter it forever, and within the masculine dynasty, the next 10 years carried many losses. John Neville Maskelyne was on stage doing a plate spinning routine on May 2nd, 1917, when he dropped two plates. He complained of ill health. The performance was his last. He would die less than one month later. Archie, the youngest, died on September 26th, 1920. Neville died suddenly on September 21st, 1924. It was not, however, the end of the fabulous masculine dynasty. Noel, Mary, and Clive were all to have successful careers in magic. And then there was Jasper, who in addition to performing magic on stage became a noted film actor. Here he's seen doing his remarkable razor blade eating routine. At the beginning of World War II, Jasper Maskelyne enlisted in the military. The problem was that the military didn't know what to do with a magician in their midst. He eventually wound up using his magic talents to help the war effort. Uh, at the beginning, this was done in a very minor way. Uh, he was asked to like come up with camouflage paint, uh, which he actually mixed from camel manure uh, and painted tanks in North African campaign. But ultimately, Maskelyne wound up playing a critical role in the uh, battle against the Nazis in, in North Africa. He performed some of the largest illusions of all time. Jasper Maskelyne made the Suez Canal disappear. He used a simple optical effect by projecting rotating beams of light into the sky. The result was a disorienting spray of light that prevented enemy bombers from locating the canal. The sad thing is, although he performed these great illusions, very few people will ever know about them because they're all done under a uh, cloak of secrecy. After the war, Jasper performed under the banner Masculine and Devant Presents, working with his family once again. He sold the show shortly afterwards and represents the last performing masculine. In 1973, with his death, the curtain was brought down. The innovations from Egyptian Hall we're still using today, the forms of entertainment, the, the, the focus on spiritual effects, which was an important early part of their performances, the mechanical magic that developed in terms of psycho, the dramatic magic, the playlets, the mascot moth, the work of David Devant. These were really only possible because there was this laboratory that, that brought an audience year after year after year. And uh, it was a petri dish for magic and it grew beautiful things and fantastic performers.
There is a tradition in magic that few have ever heard of, a tradition that has spanned a century and literally shaped the direction of an entire art form. It is a romantic notion, a lineage of kings of magic. When I was a kid, I was reading this, and it was fascinating to me, you know, to see this dynasty, this history of magic, one magician passing along his knowledge to another one. It is called the royal dynasty, and to wear the mantle, one must have already risen to a position of preeminence in the world of magic. This just happens to be an unbroken line of succession, and each time it happened to be the premier magician of that particular era. Of course, I never dreamed that my life would ever intersect this thing. This is the story of five remarkable magicians and a century of secrets. This is the story of a unique tradition, the royal dynasty of magic. Lance Burton has done what few magicians of his generation have been able to accomplish. He's produced, directed, and starred in his own full-length evening show. He fills his Las Vegas theater two times a night, 230 days a year, with a style of magic that best exemplifies the classic magic of another age. But recently, outside of public view, Lance achieved something more. On May 12, 1994, in a private ceremony at the Hacienda Hotel in Las Vegas, an event took place that brought back memories of the past, as well as a challenge for the future. Lance Burton became the latest in a succession of master magicians known as the Royal Dynasty of Magic. The Royal Dynasty is unique to magic, five very inventive magicians passing their knowledge and resources on to the next, each member setting a standard of excellence to which all magicians must aspire. Past title holders include Harry Keller, Howard Thurston, the great Dante, and Lee Grable. The royal dynasty has been called the standard by which magic ensures its own integrity as an art form. Many see the master magicians of the royal dynasty as the torchbearers of magic and showmanship, almost Arthurian in their dedication and obligation to the tradition of creating illusion. In the 20th century, there have been many great magicians, but this just happens to be an unbroken line of succession. And each time it happened to be the premier magician of that particular era. As America marched confidently into the 20th century, magic was enjoying a period of incredible popularity, a period known as Magic's Golden Age. A magician from Pennsylvania named Harry Keller emerged as the most popular conjurer on the continent, and the royal dynasty of magic was born. He was really the first great, you know, American magician. I mean, before Harry Keller, there had been no real tradition of magic in the United States. Ironically, perhaps part of the reason audiences viewed Keller as the reigning king of American magic was because he had performed on six continents in some very exotic locales. I think that was part of his attraction to the public, to, to go and see this person who had actually seen the pyramids and the Sphinx and talked with uh, Maharajis and uh, Oriental princesses and things like this. It was a very romantic thing to go and see. Keller used this exotic, mysterious image in his posters and advertising. It was, after all, good business. Keller knew the value of these posters and the excitement that the posters would generate uh, by sending people uh, to put up posters a couple of days ahead of the show. It just started a buzz in whatever town he was playing and it would get the people out. 
By all accounts, Keller's show was spectacular. He combined intimate sleight of hand magic with grand illusions like the mysterious spirit cabinet, an illusion in which spirits manifested themselves in a locked cabinet. Keller also embraced the era's love affair with technology. In an effort to keep current, he incorporated seemingly lifelike intelligent machines called automatons into his act. These clockwork-like creatures thrilled Victorian and Edwardian audiences with their ability to play cards, smoke, and make arithmetical calculations. He acquired uh, many automatons, which he would demonstrate, and that's a, a foreign notion for modern audiences, the concept of looking at this robot and being fascinated, but this is an age before movies, before television, before radio even. Keller bought this version of Psycho, uh, this little automaton that was uh, amazing and could pick cards out and play cards with people, and uh, he would perform this in his show, and audiences loved it, and Keller used it for years, and he performed it all around the world. Keller's Psycho can still be enjoyed today, thanks to the painstaking restoration work of illusion builder John Gaughan. Psycho, you're with us to, tonight. Let's see if you can uh, multiply. How about, uh, what is the answer to five times five, please? Oh, he's very fast. He's thinking. And I believe, yes, he's picked the two. One more card, Psycho. And the five, 25. Very good. Keller also introduced a number of illusions, uh, primarily the masculine levitation, which he made one of his uh, principal effects. And with it, he had great success. When the person was floating in the air under Keller's command, you could hear him drop in the audience, and people actually believed that he had this power. Keller was uh, had this aura of believability in that people liked him because he was charming, but they also believed he might have these strange powers. So he was a very good actor. He knew how to smile, and he made people love him. And again, that's one of the big secrets of being an entertainer, let alone a magician. Oh, wonderful. We'll bring him to Vegas. Yes. He'll love it here. This ability to draw people in, to engage them as a performer, is a trademark of all members of the royal dynasty. Harry Keller had it, and so does the current title holder, Lance Burton. I love your outfit, Lisa. Doesn't she look lovely? And, oh, hold on there. Wait a minute, sweetheart. You got a little tag stuck on your dress. Let me pull that off for you. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, I'll get it. Hold on. Lance sits down on the edge of the stage and talks to the people, and, and you really get the feeling that he wants to make sure they're having a good time. I think she liked that one. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Here you go. Oh, wait, Lisa, you got something else stuck in there. Let me pull that out. There it is. Your official Lance Burton magic set. <laughs> In 1908, after almost 40 years of thrilling audiences throughout the United States and the world, Harry Keller retired. This ignited speculation as to who would inherit both Keller's show and the role of Keeper of the Flame. Keller had his eyes set on a popular young magician named Howard Thurston. Thurston, I think, was a good choice. He had certainly paid his dues. He was a great card manipulator. He had toured the world. Uh, he had made a success of himself. He was performing illusions. He was a young guy with lots of get up and go. In 1908, in uh, I believe it was Baltimore, Maryland, uh, Keller passed his mantle of magic to Thurston. And the physical act was taking this uh, cloak and, and handing it over to Thurston. It was very official when Keller handed his show over to Thurston. This is my successor. This is the man who will carry magic into the future. So America could say, well, if Keller says this is the next guy, then we'll take his word for it. Thurston used this to great advantage, print, printing posters of the moment when the mantle was passed. And it was something that many other magicians were genuinely, genuinely envious of. What Thurston and Keller had done was conclude one of the greatest deals in showbiz to date. Grand as the passing of the dynastic torch was, it was also an extremely lucrative deal for both Howard Thurston and Harry Keller. 
Thurston would receive all of Keller's magic props and theater contracts, while Keller received a percentage of Thurston's box office receipts. What's interesting is to see what happened. What happened is that Howard Thurston immediately began to transform Harry Keller's show into the biggest and most spectacular magic review the world had ever seen. As the 1920s roared, America celebrated in crowded speakeasies, seemingly oblivious to the nation's experiment with prohibition. Throughout this turbulent decade, Howard Thurston reigned supreme as America's number one magician. He toured North America, playing some of the most prestigious theaters on the continent. He took the magic show and expanded it, made it a, an event. Uh, when Thurston came to town, it was an event. Uh, it was a big show with lots of assistants, and ducks and rabbits and a lion, and you know, it was like the circus coming to town. Thurston ran what he called the wonder show of the universe. He would tour the country every year, and every year he would uh, introduce some great new illusion. With his daughter Jane by his side as his assistant, Thurston presented illusions that varied from grand spectacle to intimate sleight of hand. One of Thurston's specialties was throwing cards from incredible distances with impeccable accuracy. It's a skill known as card scaling. Howard Thurston, according to legend, once threw a card to the top of an eight-story building when he was standing on the ground. Now, this is one of the very cards that uh, Thurston was known for Having thrown, it's not a regular playing card, you see, just an advertising card with uh, Howard on one side and Jane on the other. He spent tremendous volumes of money always updating his show every year, coming up with the finest effects. They went back not so much to see, oh, I wonder what new tricks Thurston's going to have this season. They went back because they wanted to spend another evening with Howard Thurston. In his 1929 autobiography, Thurston wrote, you can fool the eyes and minds of the people, but you cannot fool their hearts. As shown by this 1934 performance at the Roosevelt White House, Thurston's charismatic personality appealed to adults and children alike. You know that every boy has an egg in his mouth on Easter morning. Open your mouth wide as you can. Wide as you possibly can, let it come out. Let it come out, there you are. <laughs> He had this great way, this friendly demeanor, and people loved him, and kids loved him, and he would do tricks uh, with lots of kids on the stage, and it was funny, and he was friendly, and people just loved him. In 1923, Thurston financed a second magic show and named a virtually unknown magician, Harry Jansen, its star. He changed Jansen's name to Dante and launched him on a world tour reminiscent of Harry Keller's. The only stipulation was that while Dante could tour the rest of the world, Thurston would remain the preeminent magician in America. Jansen, in turn, would become Thurston's successor. Jane Thurston always said that if her father had searched the world over, he could never have found anyone more adaptable and more proficient to take over his show as successor than Dante. Unfortunately, Thurston never got the chance to pass on his mantle in a formal ceremony. On December 13th, 1935, Howard Thurston had a stroke shortly after a performance. He had high hopes of regaining his strength and going back on the road, but he died in the hospital in Florida in 1936. If the turn of the century belonged to Keller and the 20s belonged to Thurston, the 30s and 40s were Dante's. He created long playing records throughout Europe with his lavishly produced show and signature phrase, Sim Salabim. Sim Salabim. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Art Baker has told you the story, so let's just get right on with the problem. But first, may I call your attention to the simplicity of the arrangement. A skeleton casket scarcely large enough to accommodate Miss Miller, resting upon a four-inch platform or table. May I introduce lovely Miss Moya Miller? 
In 1933, the addition of Moyo Miller as Dante's principal assistant and later artistic director added a touch of Hollywood glamour to the show. With Moyo Miller as his co-star, along with 26 assistants and 20 tons of baggage, Dante toured the world for an incredible 12 years. His enormously successful run seemed unstoppable. Then came September 1st, 1939. We were in Germany when the war broke out. We had eight hours to get out of Berlin. We had been really ignoring our consulate's advice, leave, leave, there's going to be war. Get your show out now. And we got on the last train, second to the last train going out of Berlin, and we got over to the Scandinavian border. And we lost a lot of apparatus in uh, Berlin getting out. When we got back to the States, um, we didn't know if we'd ever see the show again. By September of 1940, Dante had managed to scrape enough equipment together to mount another show. He brought his magical review to the Morosco Theater on Broadway, where he took New York City and the critics by storm. Brilliant. He, he had the movements, he had the grace of a star of the ballet at times, but suddenly could sound like the gruff old uh, showman when he needed to with a jaunty cigar. In 1954, at the age of 71, Dante began looking for a successor, the next Keeper of the Flame. He found his man in a young magician from the West named Lee Grable. We weren't just looking for a performer, per se. He was looking for something far deeper than that, far more than that, that certain element that, that Lee had. Dante passed away in June of 1955, and the mantle of magic was passed to Lee Grable. Making magic viable in the 1950s was no easy task. The age-old art form was slowly dying as the new medium of television caught the public's imagination. Grable did what everyone said was impossible. He built a show that was packing some of the largest auditoriums in America. His signature illusion was the floating piano, an illusion in which a piano, player, and all were levitated into the air. I had a dream of the type of show I wanted, and that was comparable as much as it could be uh, to uh, Thurston show, and Keller, and Daddy's, and so forth. At the height of his success, Lee Grable surprised the magic world when he announced that he was retiring. But there would be no new addition to the royal dynasty until 1994 and Lance Burton. There was a sense of symmetry in passing the baton to Lance. It was exactly 40 years since the last investiture. After uh, I received it from Dante in 54, I gave it to Lance in 94. When I was in uh, junior high school, I, I, I had finished all the magic books in the library. I'd read all those, and I started reading the, the history of magic. And I read about, you know, the, the Keller passing along to Thurston uh, and, and, and to Dante. And, and, you know, when I was a kid, I was reading this, and it was fascinating to me, you know, to see this sort of... Uh, this, this dynasty, this history of magic of one magician passing along his knowledge to another one. <clears throat> of course, I never dreamed that this, my life would ever intersect this thing. When I met Lee Grable and he told me he wanted to name me as his successor, I, it was, you know, I was, it was unbelievable. Something that I never, never dreamed of. It was something so, so special. Oh. 
Witnessed by over 50 assembled dignitaries from the world of magic, the royal dynasty of magic was passed from Lee Grable to Lance Burton. As Lee Grable placed his cape over Lance Burton's shoulders, the assembled dignitaries were reminded that magic is about more than just tricks. Magic is an art form that many have devoted their lives to perfecting. With the mantle comes the responsibility of taking the art form into the next century, a responsibility that Lance Burton is uniquely qualified to fill. He has a great historical understanding of what's happened before him. He's not afraid to use proven ideas and to put them in front of an audience. You know watching him that you're in the hands of a master, and I'll tell you, it changes the show. People think that magic is stodgy and old-fashioned, and why would people get up there and tux and produce birds or cards or cigarettes? The only answer to that, to those very legitimate objections, is Lance Burton. Because when you see that, you see how beautiful and truly magical it can be. We're in the second golden age of magic. People always want to be entertained. People always want to be amazed. So I think there'll always be magicians around. Los Angeles Raiders, very good. And D.A.R.E. program, excellent. That's a very good program. I uh, spoke at one of the graduations uh, a few months ago, and you got a hound dog on your... <laughs> All right, excellent. Everybody take, uh, everybody take two steps forward. Nice straight line. I'll get right in the center. Good. Now we're going to do the musical portion of the show. We're going to sing Jailhouse Rock. You're the backup singers and dancers. Here we go. Two, three, four. Take it, kids. Okay, not tonight. <laughs> Sometimes they do it. It's really funny. Okay. I didn't forget your cloth, Elvis. And young lady, put your hand right there on top of the cage. Young fella, your hand on the bottom of the cage. Your hand on the front of the cage, sweetheart. Your hand on the back of the cage. Yours on the side of the cage. Yours on the other side, and yours on the top. Go ahead, reach up. Just kick them. They'll get out of your way. Okay, good. Uh, now, uh, ever, don't put your fingers in the cage. You buy, everybody take your free hand. Put that on the opposite side. Both hands. Go ahead. Ah. <laughs> Thanks, kids. Let's give them a hand, folks. Good job. For magicians, he is an icon. Yet to the public, he is virtually unknown. The professor was a magician to his core. The guy lived on tacos and brandy, and he smoked cigars. He did everything wrong. He stayed up till 2 o'clock, and he lived to be 98. He taught tricks to royalty and was on a first-name basis with moguls, millionaires, gamblers, and thieves. He changed the way magicians thought, created, and how they performed. All of his movements and his personality traits were designed to be incorporated into the performance of magic. The press called him the Canadian Merlin. His acolytes called him the Professor. His name was Di Vernon.
People don't like to be fooled. They don't want to be fooled. I don't care if you do the greatest trick. They don't like it. But if you fool them and make them enjoy it. Little innocent pea in three walnut shells. Now, they used to put the pea under one of the shells. They'd put it under very fairly and squarely under the shell. Now, they'd move the shells around like this, and you had to bet which shell the, the pea was under. It looked like a very innocent game. Well, naturally, they'd think it was under the center one. It wasn't here. It wasn't here. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even here because it's in the hand. Di Vernon was a magician revered by all other magicians. He was born in Ottawa, Canada on the 11th day of June, 1894, into a respectable family. He was even given a respectable name, David Frederick Wingfield Verner. But some years later, he acquired his nickname when a local newspaper misprinted David as Di. According to legend, Dye's interest in magic was spurred by gamblers who tossed decks of cards from the windows of passing trains. He would pick them up off the tracks and use them as practice decks. Vernon was certainly interested in the gamblers' secret moves, but more impressed that they never made mistakes. Vernon felt that the real magicians were the gamblers because they knew the techniques that magicians didn't know. If a magician screws up, they laugh at him. If a card cheat screws up, they kill him. With magic, Vernon would never make mistakes. Vernon's family pushed him into studying engineering at Kingston's Royal Military College. He considered his degree useful, applying his understanding of mechanics to magic. But as far as his family was concerned, Dai threw it all away. After serving in World War I, he set out to become a professional magician. Naturally, he went to New York City. Vernon wowed audiences at the Kit Kat Club and the Rainbow Room with an act that reinvented close-up magic as simple and elegant. He uh, made things not look phony. Everything looked as though uh, it had a non-magical purpose to it and, uh, and some natural uh, open reason for doing everything. Vernon learned his card tricks from a little known book called The Expert at the Card Table, now known in magic circles by the name of its author, Erdenaise. A guide for professional card cheats and gamblers, it was also the perfect introduction to imperceptible hand movements and slights which were perfect for close-up magic. It became his Bible, and Vernon subsequently introduced the book to the magic community, which now embraces it as a classic. That was one of the reasons he became a big hero in New York, because he knew everything in that book, and nobody else knew it. Nobody else ever read that book. And they'd say, well, where did you get that? He said, well, that's in Erdenace. He claimed uh, very modestly not to be an originator, just to have read between the lines in Erdenace. Vernon believed in reducing a trick to its bare essence, simplifying the complex, and making movements appear invisible and totally natural. He really had a way of taking any idea and, and making it usually not only physically easier to do, but more deceptive at the same time, which is really terrific. You know, it's, it's, it's quite easy to uh, make a move less effective by making it physically easier, but he was able to make it more deceptive and easier very often. Vernon was fond of saying, confusion is not magic, and it's, it's a very important thing for a magician to understand. The spectator shouldn't walk out saying to himself, boy, I'm confused. The spectator should walk out saying, I know what happened, and it was impossible. Vernon amazed audiences with these simple, uncomplicated gestures. His approach was dubbed the Vernon Touch, and magicians emulating his style soon flocked to a renovated mansion devoted to the study and performance of magic, the Magic Castle in Los Angeles. It was here where Vernon, as the house magician, became a mentor and a teacher. We started having lecturers come out to lecture 
for the members. And uh, Udai came out to lecture for, uh, for the club. And uh, if any of you remember the play, uh, The Man Who Came to Dinner, uh, Dai came, he saw the castle, saw a chair that he liked and sat in it and uh, immediately moved out to California and, uh, and really never went back to New York. Vernon is why all of the magicians uh, came out to the West Coast. Uh, as I said, when he was in New York, the mecca of magic was New York. Every great magician, uh, Cardini was there. You could just find them all, and they were all around Vernon. Vernon went to the West Coast in the 60s. All the magicians followed him. Dozens would study under Vernon, including John Thompson, Bruce Servan, Michael Amar, and fellow Canadian Doug Henning. Vernon taught them to focus and simplify their acts. As a teacher, he had a sharp eye, a sharper tongue, and absolutely no tolerance for mediocrity. He's like in this conversation, he's yelling at somebody, and this is, I'm thinking, what is going on? And I, as I come closer and I round the corner, I realize that what's taking place is the fellow who performed that afternoon has asked the professor for his advice and his feedback, and what do you think? And, and the professor is just, He's yelling, he's, it was awful. It was the worst thing I've ever, do yourself a favor, get out of magic, get out of, and, but, but they were laughing, didn't you hear them? No, no, they were laughing at you. They were laughing at you, not with you. And he goes, you are the worst, the worst, no, wait, no. No, there was one other guy, but you're the second worst performer I've ever seen. He had a great eye. He could watch your act, and he could tell you things that he saw that were amazing. He did that the first time I was at the Magic Castle. It was terrific. Uh, and, and I took his advice always. <laughs> one time we're sitting upstairs, and we were talking about some move, esoteric move. And all of a sudden, a fella comes in who was a, not a good magician, and he says to Vernon, he said, here, Vernon, let me have your cards. I want to show you a card trick. Well, Vernon was being kind, and so the guy, the guy says, take a card, and the guy, and he does it very badly, you know, and he puts it back, and he, he talks and talks, and he finally counts down to like, blah, 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 and Vernon says, there's the card, and the guy says, and there's your card, the Queen of Hearts. And so Vernon now looks at the guy and said, I'm going to tell you something. I could go down at Hollywood Boulevard and I can take a five-year-old boy and teach him to do that trick better than you do it in three minutes. He said, you don't have any idea what magic is about. You don't know how to hold the cards. You don't understand the trick. You don't understand the concept. You don't understand magic. You don't understand to present it. You don't know anything. You know nothing about magic. You're an idiot. You, you just have no idea what you're doing. You're just a, you're, you're an idiot with a deck of cards. You should never have the cards in your hand. You should stick to those stupid sponge balls. And I can't believe that you did. This is the worst thing I ever, now at this point, the guy just turns around and he walks over to the stairs and he walks upstairs to go to the dining room to eat dinner. And Vernon is screaming, and it was awful. I can't believe how horrible it was. It was the worst thing I ever saw. And when the guy gets out of sight, he's screaming at the top of his lungs. He gets out of sight, and I'm just kind of sitting there like this, you know. And Vernon leans over to me and says, do you know what's wrong with that guy? He doesn't know how to take criticism. Vernon did more than teach. He became one of the first magicians to lecture and was, by all accounts, fascinating to hear. Vernon was a wonderful lecturer, too. In fact, Vernon was one who normally spoke fast. In a lecture, he spoke fast. Now, you presume to shuffle by doing this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Of course, you don't count out loud. You just count to yourself, eleven. Now, you take one less the number of players, which would be four. One, two, three, four. Then you take the number of players, five. One, two, three, four, five. A single card, and then t twice the number of players, ten. Now, this sounds complicated, but it's not. And at the end, because time was running out, and I don't mean he wasn't under a time restriction, but he was going hoarse, and he may have talked for three or four hours straight. At the end, he would just be double fast. He would talk double fast and I'm going sorry, as fast as he could to get cards, more material the in the so the people get would get to, to see more. And remember those numbers. Twice the number of players plus one, one less the number of players, the number of players, one card, and twice the number of players. If you do that, you can do it just the same way as I did it right now. As a performer, mentor, and raconteur, 
Vernon was approached by scores of magicians, but on one occasion he solidified his reputation as a master of deception, when in 1919 he was challenged by the legendary Harry Houdini and became the only magician to ever fool Houdini. Houdini wasn't, didn't do any magic. He didn't do, he did escapes. Houdini also challenged magicians to fool him. Only one succeeded, Di Vernon, in 1919. Well, Harry was the kind of a guy who didn't want to be fooled by these tricks at all. What he wanted to do was he wanted to see them maybe, but he didn't want to show that he was fooled. What happened with this Vernon trick, Vernon said, all right, now he said, take the cards. So Houdini, take them, and he shuffled them up and mixed them around. And Vernon says, all right, fine. He said, I'm going to take that card. I'm going to take that card like this. He said, I'm going to take that card, and I'll put that card right down here in the middle of the deck like that. He said, all right, now watch this. He said, look, did you see any movement at all there? The guy says, well, no, I didn't see anything. He said, well, look, see, now the card came back to the top again. He said, now, here, I'll show you again. Now, look, I'll show you again. So he put the card down in there like this, and he puts it down in there. He squares them up nice and neat, and he said, now, look, see, look, look. The card came back to the top. Well, it's got Harry's name on it, so he knows that there can't be two cards there. He says, let me see that card. So he looks at the card, you know, and he sees that the card is just a single single card. So then Vernon repeats the trick. He does it again, and he said, well, do it again, and he does it again, and he does it again, and he does it again, and Harry cannot figure out how the trick works. Though he was known as the man who fooled Houdini, there was another great mind in modern card magic, Ed Marlowe. A prolific writer of complex card manipulation, Marlowe's approach was the opposite of Vernon's. Their vastly differing techniques caused a philosophical rift between the two men, dating back to the 1950s and an annual magic convention in Colon, Michigan, known as the Abbott's Get Together. For over 60 years, magicians have flocked to this small Michigan town for an informal week of performance and idea swapping. And it was here that Di Vernon first met Ed Marlowe. Back in Colon, Michigan, when they first had the get together, they held the get together in tents. And that's where he first got together with Vernon. And they treated him less than wonderfully. He never forgot that, but they weren't particularly polite to him. He was the kid from Chicago. And by their standards, he was a kid. He was uh, 20 years or so younger from a different generation. And that was, that's where part of the competition developed. Their differing theoretical approaches, Vernon's minimalist simplicity versus Marlowe's technical wizardry, led to different performance styles and camps. To this day, magicians will call certain moves a Vernon and others a Marlowe. It was a difference in approach that crossed into other areas as well. Marlowe, the technician, apparently felt the need to record practically every move he perfected. Marlowe tried to uh, publish every variation once he thought of a method of doing something. He would publish, uh, it seems like, hundreds of methods for, for having someone cut the deck and to four heaps and having the top of them be aces. Ed probably liked to delve with every possible method, you know, e even maybe the bad methods, thinking maybe he could make something good out of it. And uh, many times it was a fruitless effort, and I don't think Vernon probably did that. He, he just said, nah, that's no good, and went on to something better. I don't think that it's fair to say Vernon versus Marlowe is, is performer versus technician. Uh, Vernon's influence uh, was also on technique as well as on uh, plots and so on. But I think that the biggest influence that Vernon had, uh, which Marlowe did not have on card magic, was on style. He was, a, he was a perfectionist, and he used to tell magicians, he said, you learn one trick, just one trick, and you do it better than anyone in the world, and people will remember you. And he was very right. Like Marlowe, he produced writings of the highest caliber, but one book came to be viewed as his masterpiece, the Di Vernon Book of Magic. 
It was reading Vernon long before I ever met him where he really molded my work. There's a chapter in the Vernon Book of Magic called The Vernon Touch that just talks about practice and the love of practice. And that if you don't love practice, maybe you should try something else. And it talked about naturalness. And it really talked about a way to be, not just a way to be a magician, but a way to be. And I read that chapter over and over and over again when I tell you hundreds of times, not dozens, hundreds. You know, he once said to me, Johnny, I, I'd pay a thousand dollars to get another book like Erdnace. And I said, so would I, Professor, but I have another book like Erdnace, and it didn't cost me a thousand dollars. And he said, what's that? I said, the Day Vernon Book of Magic. And he got this guy, he, he was always, he would get shy when you complimented him, but uh, he had a nice smile on his face when I told him that. Vernon died in 1992 at the incredible age of 98, a life in magic spanning six decades. His final years were spent in the company of a cadre of young magicians who became both his protégés and friends. Respectfully referred to as the professor, one of his favorite pastimes was kicking back with a glass of scotch, a fine cigar, and an audience to hear his stories of legendary magicians. Everyone from Cardini to Keller, Houdini to both Blackstones, to Channing Pollock to Doug Henning, he was able to entertain friends with first-hand accounts of every one of them. He was a real piece of living history, because he would tell you these stories about Houdini, that he, he was actually there when it happened, in Downs and these other legends. Uh, but at the time, no one knew that he was going to end up to be such a raconteur at the age of 95. Di Vernon was... In my estimation, the dean of magicians, the greatest single magician living in my lifetime, he's responsible for magic being where it is today, the high quality of magic we have today, and especially in sleight of hand. This man fooled Houdini. Uh, this man was a bridge to legends of magic that, that few people ever got to become uh, intimate with or, or contemporaries with. In addition to his magical legacy, Vernon also left behind opinions on, apparently, everything, from the best way to palm a card to the best way to walk through a darkened room. If all the lights go out in your house, he said, there's a power outage. He said, how do you walk around in the dark to make sure you don't hurt yourself? Well, yeah, you go like this. Well, Vernon says, no, no, no. He said, what happens if the door is right here and you don't hit the door and you sm walk smack into the door? It was always just full of little insights. No, the best way to walk through a dark room is to touch your thumbs so that nothing goes between your hands. Well, he said, the way you do it is you put your thumbs together. That way, nothing can come between your hands. I mean, little tidbits like that were always coming out in conversations. Or, do you know how to find which way is up uh, if you're buried in an avalanche? No, I don't. Vernon was like a guy that you got in his car, and his radio got stations that your car didn't get. Well, you clear out of space, and then you spit, and you, you see which direction uh, uh, gravity pulls it, and you dig in the opposite direction. Uh, I'll make a mental note of that. His mind was always great, and he used these cards, and he used working out a new trick or inventing a new move as a kind of a mental exercise, and it kept him very... Uh, right on the edge, right on the edge of things. One day I sat with Vernon, and uh, we were sitting at the bar opposite the Palace of Mystery uh, at the uh, Magic Castle. And he said, Johnny, how's your health? And I said, my health is fine, Professor. It's kind of like you, you know. You never get sick, I never get sick. I've got a good immune system. He says, well, sometimes that's a blessing, and sometimes it's not. And with that, he brought out three yellow uh, legal sized pages with three columns on each side of the most famous magicians uh, Chung Ling Su, Houdini, uh, you name it, everybody in the last hundred years is on, is on these three sheets of paper. And he said, Those are all my friends. They're all dead. Well, I didn't know what to say. It was a long moment. And I said, uh, Day, I, I, I really don't know what to say. He said, No, it's all right, Johnny. I keep making new friends. <laughs> Used, uh, they used just the four aces like this, and he always used to mention that the aces, see, but this trick has, a, has what you call 
effect. It's very simple. It, Ace of Spades, I want you to notice, has more ink on it than, say, for example, the Ace of Hearts. And I mean, it does, really, and it therefore weighs a little bit more. Not much, but enough so that you can see the difference. You can feel the difference if you have a scale, a very minute scale. So anyway, we're going to save that Ace of Spades for last. So what you do is you simply spin the cards like this, see? Like that. Now what that does, even though you can see the cards almost directly on edge, one of the cards turns over. I don't know if you saw the move when I did it or not, but if you did, I, you'll be, you have a very keen eye. You see there, the Ace of, Ace of Diamonds is now turned uh, face up. Now watch this like a hawk. You know what I'm going to do. We just spin it like that, and I'm certain that you didn't see what happened, because see, the Ace of Hearts then turns face up. Now there's only one left, that's the Ace of Spades. Now let's do this very, very quickly. Look, we just spin it like that. The Ace of Spades, the heaviest one, turns... Wait a minute. The Ace of Spades turns face... Hmm. Well, wait a second. There's one thing that you can do with that. So you just snap it that way, and then you can cause the last one to turn face up. There's a real change that's been going on in the last 15 years, a tremendous change of more and more women coming into magic. The tradition of the tuxedo-clad magician and his lovely female assistant is something of an icon for the art of magic, and magic has historically been a male-dominated profession. But as the popularity of magic explodes, women are becoming more and more prominent as headliners in their own right. Metamorphosis is a classic illusion of magic. The magician, usually a man, disappears only to reappear transformed into his female assistant. As with Las Vegas based magic duo Mark and Ginger, executing this variation on the complicated spectacle requires the dedication and skills of both performers men and women relying on one another. The fact is that despite their major contributions to the art, women have been largely unrecognized throughout the history of magic. Women have always been performing on stage. They just haven't made the famous factor that we know about. But all throughout history, there have always been great magicians. That's the way that a lot of women's magic and women's energy works, you know, is that we, we are often very much the, the supporters you know, that supports the structure of a system, and but we're not necessarily the ones that come forward and that are like in the spotlight. Today's women in magic often seek out heroines of the past, female role models who dared to assert themselves and challenge audiences to accept magicians of either sex. More recently, after assisting David Copperfield for eight and a half years, Joni Spina transformed her life and moved center stage as a performer.
Throughout the history of magic, women have been faced with more than lack of recognition as their triumphs were often eclipsed by the accomplishments of men. Their strong role in the art has sometimes meant risking their lives for magic. It's been difficult for women in magic for the past couple of hundred years, going back to the Inquisition, that any woman that was involved in magic was, was basically burned as a witch. Uh, but if you go back before that, there's a very rich history of women being healers and wise women and oracles, you know, being extremely psychic. There's all the, the great archetypes of the wise woman, the, uh, the witch healer, uh, the oracle of Delphi and all the other oracular you know, strains that came off of that. In a time where a lady rarely spoke unless spoken to, it's difficult to imagine women defying social standards by pursuing careers in magic. One trailblazer was the vivacious Mercedes Talma, born Marianne Ford in 1868 and hired as a magician's assistant by Survey Leroy. The audiences adored Marianne who eventually married Leroy and adopted the stage name Mercedes Talma. Unlike many women on stage at the time, Mercedes wasn't merely an attractive adornment, but a significant part of his act. Adept at coin manipulation, Mercedes was dubbed Queen of Coins and often performed tricks solo. Another pioneering spirit was Adelaide Herman, who honed her magic skills after marrying into the Herman family, one of the world's greatest magic dynasties. At the beginning of the century, Adelaide Herman, who was the widow of Alexander Herman, a famous magician, toured vaudeville with a really sensational stage production. When we look at the pictures of this today, I mean, it looks like uh, a setting for a grand opera. Born Adelaide Scarce, she parlayed her skills as a professional dancer into a career as magician's assistant to her husband. After his death in 1896, financial necessity forced her to continue performing. It was audacity and showmanship that made her a star. During a career that spanned four decades, she traveled the world before retiring at the age of 73. Being a female entertainer has never been easy. In the 1930s and 40s, a woman in the entertainment business was perceived as being on the edge, or worse, loose. The idea that a woman might shun marriage in favor of touring from city to city without a chaperone was considered outrageous. One such maverick was Del O'Dell, a born entertainer who injected her trademark wit into everything she did leaving an enduring legacy and influencing subsequent generations. Dell started out as a weightlifter. She was a, a strong woman in the circus before she became a magician. Uh, and she would speak in rhyme. So she, I think she was um, revolutionary on one level in that she was able to transcend the glamour thing. She was a remarkably versatile performer. She was at, as equally at home with uh, performing in front of a group of sailors and I'm told her language would be appropriate for the occasion. Um, you know, she'd wear low-cut dresses and make lewd remarks. Um, and then the next moment, she could turn around and do a, a children's birthday party and be completely appropriate in that setting, too. The significant thing about Del O'Dell is the remarkable success she had in a period of time when magic wasn't well recognized. Most magicians were trying to hack out a living doing an occasional nightclub spot or a kid's birthday party. Del O'Dell had her own television show. But even before Del O'Dell, another conjuring woman graced television screens. Jerry Larson delighted children in the early 1950s, playing a sweet fairy living in a land of enchantment on her weekly television show. She was the first lady magician to ever have her own television show, The Magic Lady. People were very impressed that a lady could do all these tricks and all these, all that magic. So it was a very, very good series. As the former editor of the international magic journal Genie Magazine, German-born Irene Larson is herself no stranger to the business. 
She had been working as an assistant for several years by the time she married magician Bill Larson Jr. in 1963, at which point she began to divide her time working with her husband and assisting such magicians as Orson Welles and Jack Quinn. Like Irene Larson, most women get their start in magic by becoming an assistant. Integral to any act, it's one of magic's most underestimated roles. As a child, magician Luna Shamada got an early taste of it by assisting her father, the magician Shamada. Magician's assistants have always been kind of like the slave labor of show business. <laughs> you know, we do all the magic and all the work and get none of the credit. Since their early days on stage, assistants have come a long way from the time when they often did little more than stand quietly holding the next prop. In the 1960s, veteran assistant Nani Darnell bridged the gap between assistant and co-star by becoming more involved in the act, from designing the show to business affairs. I did things like helping with the costuming. Uh, I helped work with the magic tricks as they were created. I worked in almost every phase of what we did. Husband and wife, Mark and Ginger Kalin, who perform as Mark and Ginger, were determined from the start that their relationship remain as equal on stage as off, something they're very conscious of communicating to their audience. At the same time, we didn't necessarily want to take the tack of two magicians, because I think what's interesting about male and female is that you're different. So it's finding ways to, uh, you know, sort of accentuate what's different about each other without falling into a uh, uh, stereotype. It's important to um, realize that it takes uh, two of us to create the magic. Doesn't mean that we both have to be magicians. and their chemistry has definitely had an intriguing effect on the audience. When I had worked with, with the other girls before Ginger, they always were a little bit upset because after the show, people would only refer to them as uh, Mark's assistant. You'd say, oh yeah, that's Mark Kalin, and oh, and his assistant, right? Well, I'm walking through the casino and this mother's walking with her kid, this little boy, and uh, he stops his mom and says, look, mom, there's Ginger's magician. <laughs> That's when I knew that uh, there was something there. But no matter how democratic a scenario, at the end of the day, the magician is still the idol. And so the bolder female assistants eventually strike out on their own and become magicians in their own right. I felt I ought to do my own work at some point, you know. And I had, had staged for so many magicians that uh, my body language, you know, I mean, I did both the magician's roles and the, the assistant's roles as far as choreographing and movement and working with people. Yet some women believe it doesn't matter if performers are men or women. Working the birthday party circuit, magician Lisa Mena believes she got bookings regardless of sex. I don't think the people that hired me, the mother just said hired me, hired me because I was a magician. They hired me because if Lisa Lollipop wasn't at your birthday, you weren't cool. It was a whole entertainment experience. I think that uh, whether it was magic or it was gags or it was comedy wasn't a concern to them. And it certainly wasn't a concern to them that I was a little girl and not a little boy. But the battle of the sexes isn't over yet, as even the most accomplished women in magic will attest. Magic is still dominated by men, and for audiences, old stereotypes die hard. It's a major, major obstacle, you know, to, to stage, to stage the material because the audience naturally wants to give credit to the man because they view the man as a, he's bigger, he's stronger than the woman, and they want to give the male the credit for what's happening up there. Okay. You got it? Yeah. Sign your name on the top somewhere. As a secret of society, magic has always been something of a boys' club with its own rules, ideas, and traditions. And for women, this can mean constraints, even with things as basic as clothing. Take the tuxedo, the magician's classic uniform. Its main intention may be to lend an air of ceremony to performances, but it also has a function. Pockets, something women's designer clothing lacks. Now think about that. 
no pockets. No pockets in the skirt, no pockets in the coat. Because to put things in your pockets would be to ruin the lines of the clothes. So now you have women, uh, they have a lot of adjustments to make. Because everything they read has to be adapted to them. But the bigger problem is that magic, as most men do it, is a power display. And we don't want women being powerful in our society. We resent those images. And so women have had a rough time of it, uh, trying to find out what their own path in magic is, not only in terms of how to carry stuff when you don't have any pockets, but also how to, what is the persona of this woman. For a woman to have power and to have a secret and keep the secret and not tell isn't nice. And the first thing we're trained as girls is to be nice. You know that women fear not being liked or not being nice or thought of as being rude. And all of those things are things that one must do if you are keeping a secret and presenting the, the effect to the audience and saying, I have the power to do this and I know and I'm not telling you. One of the fundamental problems is when you think of a magician, a magician is a, a very male archetype. You know, the wand is a phallus. But in the women's tradition, the women is the high priestess, is the oracle, and the her tool is the cup. If you look in the tarot, the, the, the priestess is the keeper of the mysteries and the initiator. So perhaps, you know, over the years, women have been playing the wrong archetype where they've been focusing on the magician. Maybe it's time to start researching the women's archetypes throughout history and to access the other archetypes that the woman has had uh, has played throughout history. Although the market has opened up for women over the last few years, the prevailing image of the sexy assistant has made it difficult for many women to be taken seriously. It was difficult for women to, to start because we became so stereotyped as assistants. I remember going through customs one day and telling them that I was a magician you know, by trade, and they said, are you a magician or are you an assistant? You know, <laughs> and it was just like this basic example of, of, of a mindset that, you know, I think a lot of women run into. As a solution, photographer Ann White launched the Women in Magic Conference in Hollywood in April 97 as a venue for female conjurers to discuss every aspect of the business from their perspective. Where else could you be at three in the morning with another woman magician with small hands showing you how to do a magic manipulation, which you'd never understood how to do before because these men with big hands were telling you how to do it. And you needed to adjust for the size of the hands. I can't show everybody how I hide the pigeon beneath my skirt and pull it out in mixed company. With girls, I can say, look, I can hike up my skirt and say, check it out, this is a great way to do it. I think that uh, women are coming to magic out of a very different mindset than men do. And it really is more about sharing than it is about power. And maybe it's even more about healing than it is about power. But you know, we're in a state where it's always difficult to evaluate what's going on right in front of your nose. You know, when you get a little distance from things, then you can see them clearly. And that's why my prediction is that in 20 years, the impact of women on magic is probably going to be something we can't imagine right now. And since women differ from men in fundamental ways, their artistic and presentation styles reflect, obviously, more traditionally feminine sensibilities. And you can tell very immediately if that show's been designed by a man or a woman, because a man will involve mutilation themes, he'll involve conquest themes, he'll involve themes that involve power. If you see a woman's magic show, like, for example, Jade, she's one of the best lady magicians in the world. She produces abundance of rice, fountains of flowers, water, she brings butterflies to life. Everything that she does is about creating miracles of abundance and production. Whereas the idea of um, conquest or survival or torture or pain is um, very much a male dominated thought pattern. I think that uh, what makes women's magic different from men is that we tend to take more of a um, artistic approach to it and a, and a more creative 
kind of approach, and that those are the, the elements that we work with. We work with creation, we work with beautiful themes, and, you know, and so uh, art plays a big part in our style, in the way that we, we, we look at our magic and the way we view our magic. It becomes more about just being out there and going, hey, I'm the powerful one and you're not. I like movement, I like sensuality, I like emotion, I like passion. And those are the things that I want to express in my work, more so than uh, danger. But if I were to expand my act, I would definitely put something, an escape, something dangerous, death-defying, definitely. But the times are changing, and contemporary female conjurers are setting a new stage, creating their own niche in magic. There's a real change that's been going on in the last 15 years, a tremendous change of more and more women coming into magic. So we have people like Jade and Luna Shimada, Margaret Steele, Melinda, you know, lots of women in magic, uh, many that you've never heard of, but all doing it and doing it well. 13-year-old Brittany Malatesta uses the stage name The Lizard Wizard, but even with her strong dedication to magic, some men have dismissed her talent because of her sex. It's a problem she noted in a letter Ann White read at the Women in Magic conference. I have a boy as my assistant and also three other girls to fill in if he's sick. I haven't had too much trouble yet, except when I go into magic shops and they ignore me and try to sell me junk. Now that my picture was in Magic Magazine, they treat me better. Sometimes old men magicians will give me dumb advice, like how I should wear a cute, short costume instead of my Tibetan panel coat. I think that it's certainly a, a, the women's job now in the world to present entertainment in such a fashion that they don't have to buy, we don't have to buy into it the way, way, the way we are pushed. It's very easy now for young women to believe that that's the most important thing. But now there are role models available to us that are not glamorous and beautiful and their first and most important value is not to be attractive to men. Maybe they are clever, maybe they are smart, maybe they are sarcastic, maybe they are strong. And their impact will echo in the future. I think most of the jobs I get have nothing to do with if I'm a man or a woman. Most of the jobs I get have to do with, are the, is the audience bewildered and entertained? So there's a big change happening, and it's, and it's going to be interesting to see in 20 years what the impact of women in magic is. I'm looking forward to, to the future of magic. I think that it's moving in a very progressive direction. Mentalism is the one area of magic that people buy as being legitimate still. It's the year test. I hope I get this right. Is it 1963? Are you born in 63? Yes, I am. Have we ever met before? Never. Thank you very much, Brenda. That's fantastic Thank test. You. you got it. 
we don't have to sit down with a prop because we're, our prop is our two minds. Examine his thoughts. Well, I wasn't sure at first, but I was wondering if that's Brian. And your name is? Brian. Is it Brian Walsh? Oh, is it Brian Walsh? Yes. Thank you very much, oh, Brian. I have used my five senses to produce the illusion of a sixth. Who is K.R. Kirsten? Who is Kirsten? Our niece. Your niece. How many nieces do you have? Two. The other, Shelley? Thank you for standing. I appreciate it very much. This is very basic, pure, um, fundamental magic. Because if you can do magic with the mind, never mind pulling the rabbit out of the hat, how did you know my phone number? That's what was being asked. Let's give this a try. Is there anybody in the audience with a purse? Just uh, we, we, any woman out oh, there. Oh, I hope we get purse. somebody to help us who, out. Who has one? No, no, you're, no, not your purse, sir. I want to get a woman. Jeff and Tessa specialize in a branch of magic called mentalism, oh, yeah. which basically is magic done with the mind. Where sleight of hand specialists enlist cards and coins, mentalist magicians perform a sort of sleight of mind. Though they may appear to be psychic, mentalists like Jeff and Tessa are actually magical entertainers. With the sewing supplies, a sewing kit. Yeah. What's inside this little? Oh, little sewing kit over there, from a uh, from a hotel. Yes, she yeah. stole that from the Hilton Hotel. She's. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, it'll come in handy. All kinds of things sure. inside this purse. More. And, uh, yes. And uh, You've got more business cards than I know well, what to do with. Lots of those. Inside. Yeah. What the heck is this inside? Well, you keep focusing on that packet, and I'm thinking of a packet of ketchup. No kidding. Kentucky Fried Chicken. She actually has a Kentucky Fried Chicken ketchup inside her yeah. purse, ladies and gentlemen. Look at that little ketchup. Boy, you get to all the. <laughs> I really brought that got all my... the way from someplace. Uh, I well, I think mentalism is a more mature branch of magic. Um, it's messing with people's minds. It's sometimes creating the illusion that you are reading somebody's mind. Well, the lady that I got a thought from a moment ago was Brenda. You might be somebody else. Uh, is your name Brenda? Yes, it is. Yeah, how about it? That's it. Very good. In fact, uh, Brenda. Well, I was trying to focus with Brenda because she was sending a thought about her object. Is it Clark you send a thought? Your last name? It's Clark. Uh, it this is, is Brenda Clark. Clark. Yes, it is. Now, Brenda, that is your driver's license that you this have. This is your driver's license? Yes, it is. Uh, can you, okay, hold on to this. Let's, uh, thank you very much for... Thank you very much, Brenda, but I want to try something else with you because I had an impression about a month, the month of Did March. That? Is that relevant to you? Is that your birthday by any chance? You born in March? Yes, I was. Can I get you to think now of the day for me? It's at the very beginning of March. That's a sense I have. The first few days. Is it the 4th? You are born March 4th? Yes, I was. Yes, you are. You want to go for the year. It's up to you. The year, Tess. I hope I get this right. Is it 1963? Are you born in 63? Yes, I am. Have we ever met before? Sure. Thank you very much, Brenda. That's fantastic, Thank Tess. You. you got it. Good Jeff and Tessa are among a new generation of mentalists, following the footsteps of great mental illusionists like Peter Ravine, James Randi, and the biggest name in mentalism, the amazing Kreskin. I consider mentalism really an art form, where you're working with the behavior and the thought patterns of people using suggestion, uh, intuitiveness, maybe some form of telepathy. If telepathy doesn't exist, then we have to redefine it and then some showmanship to dramatize it, even if you're dipping into magic. That's my definition of a mentalist. With the date of, you, your mind is flitting back and forth over dates. Would the date of October 26 mean something to you? That's right. What date does, what does that mean to you? It's my birthday. It is your birthday. I will not go for the year out of deference to you, <laughs> lovely gal. What does 
I've never met you before, have I? What does March 19th mean to you? That's my husband's birthday. Yeah, how, ma how many of you are in the family? Do you have any children? Two. Two? You're a miracle worker also <laughs> on the side. You were wondering if I could give you their birthdays too, weren't you? Right. It's one March 16th? Right. Whose is that? My son. And the other's a daughter? Mm-hmm. Was your daughter born on April 18th? Right. Thank you very much for standing here. Though Kreskin may be mentalism's biggest name today, there have been a long line of greats before him. The history of mentalism dates back to ancient civilizations and is even mentioned in early Egyptian texts. Encoded within glyphs is the story of Sio Sere, the first recorded mentalist magician. There's a story in which a Nubian magician challenges him to a stage contest the Nubian magician arrives at court and bears a sealed letter from the king of the Sudan, and he challenges any magician to be able to read it. Sio Sire promptly takes the letter, puts it to his forehead, and announces a very long story describing old feuds between the two kingdoms, all of which is detailed in the letter. Remarkably, mentalist magic has changed very little since then. At the end of the 19th century, the Zanzigs popularized the Second Sight Act. Julius Zanzig would solicit information from the audience, which his blindfolded wife would then convey, creating the illusion of ESP. Billed as two minds with but a single thought, their Second Sight Act became a mentalist standard, still performed by entertainers like Jeff and Tessa. Okay. So the two different people send a clear thought. The strongest thought I have right now, the person has a card with them. And the card is related to money. The person I'm focusing with has a bank card. Yeah, it is. It is too. Okay. And the Good. belongs to this man. Uh, oh, which it, bank is this, Tess? It, can you focus on it for me? I kept seeing green. Is it the, is it the Toronto Dominion Bank? That's uh, my. It's a green card, Toronto Dominion Bank. Good. Yes, and more. You didn't answer the a gentleman's first name, Tess. No, I wasn't. I'm quite sure you know. Examine his thoughts. Well, I wasn't sure at first, but I was wondering if that's Brian. And your name is? Brian. Is it Brian Walsh? Oh, is it Brian Walsh? Yes. Thank you very much, oh, well, Brian. That's amazing. Thank you. Yes. In a little bit different manner. In a way that you Another classic mentalist illusion is called the Blindfold Act, where a blindfolded mentalist performs seemingly impossible feats like reading newspapers or copying handwriting. Kuda Bucks, known as the man with the X-ray eyes, took the Blindfold Act one step further. With his eyes wrapped in layers of cookie dough, cotton batting, and thick bandages, Bucks could not only copy handwriting, he could also ride a bicycle through city streets and even sharpshoot. But mentalism would really take hold through the unlikely medium of radio. For a time, many mentalists used the art for fortune telling and for giving pseudo psychic advice. In the 1940s, a mentalist known as Dunninger became a radio superstar, making mentalism a popular form of entertainment for the masses. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Have we ever met before? No, we haven't. The very first time we spoke to one another? Yes. Your mother does, mother-in-law does live in Baltimore, Maryland? Yes, she does. Is that address uh, 506 D-R-U-R-Y Lane? That's correct. I appreciate your standing in that. Thank time. you. Dunninger decided there must be a way of doing a mental act without ask, answering questions, giving people advice. And he did a turning point of his career. He worked alone. He was a great showman. Dunninger's radio show inspired a new generation of mentalists. As a young magician, James Randi caught Dunninger's stage act and was even pulled out of the audience as a volunteer. He turned to me and he said, young man, would you take this slate and this piece of chalk and, um, excuse me, young man, are you a conjurer? And I thought to myself, it raced through my head, am I wearing a, a rabbit pin? Have I got silk handkerchief hanging out of my pocket, a billiard ball in my hand? What, how could he possibly know? I said, well, yes, I'm only an amateur and I'm studying. I thought as much, sir. Young man, I hate to say this, but I have to dismiss you and send you back into the audience. These people might be unkind enough to think that we were in cahoots. So if you will take your seat, I'll find another way to have these numbers added. Thank you for coming up. Give them a round of applause. I went down to the audience absolutely stunned. How could he possibly have guessed? 
Now, what it was was just an attempt, a sort of a lucky guess. He would try it. If it didn't work, it was only a joke. But if it did work, it was a miracle. Another Dunninger fan who went on to become a top mentalist is the amazing Kreskin. Known for his many late-night television appearances and for his popular 1970s series, The Amazing World of Kreskin, he made himself into a household name. You concentrate on anything which may have special meaningfulness to you, and I'll jot my impressions down on this folio or pad as soon as they come to me. Stan, if, if it's true, if it acknowledges a thought, Somebody here in the audience is concentrating his or her thoughts on, well, I get S, H on the, the initials S, H. Do they ring a bell in anyone's mind? No, wait a minute, I'm sorry, S, H, A, N, T. Someone think of shanty or something like that? Would you kind of, two people thinking of shanty? I hope you're together. Yes. <laughs> you are together. What does it mean to you, please, may I ask? Oh Kreskin's act ran the gamut from mentalism to mind reading, to making predictions, to hypnotism, to finding objects hidden in the theater. He became so confident of this ability that for some shows he had the audience hide his paycheck before every show. If he didn't find it, he didn't get paid. It's led to some very bizarre moments. At Northwestern, at a university in Illinois, amongst 8,000 people, I went up to a man and asked him to open his mouth. and. I looked at him, I said, I've never asked anybody to do this in my life. It does, does it have to do with the roof of your mouth? And he reached out, took out his upper plates, and they hid in his upper plates. His name is Peter Ravine, and as a world-renowned hypnotist and mental illusionist, he's played to over eight million people. His specialty was hypnotism. Ravine found his inspiration in a serious article printed in a newspaper in his native Australia. I wrote an article in a newspaper concerning a padre, an American padre during the war, who hypnotized some Australian troops, and it described what he did. And I tried it on a, a school friend called Ray Curley, and I tried it on him and it worked. Ravine eventually studied the art of hypnotism from every book and medical journal he could find, and he was surprised at what he discovered. I realized that it wasn't something mysterious, it wasn't a special power, that it was suggestion. Performers like Kreskin and Ravine use mentalist magic as a performance art, but this art has often been misused by some practitioners. One of the most notorious examples involves a talented mentalist who joined the Nazi party. From the upper echelons of power, he attempted to use his magic on the minds of the public. Mentalism has at times provoked controversy, mainly because some of the great mentalists were not magicians, but con artists. One of the more bizarre stories involving a mentalist revolves around an Austrian named Erich von Hennessen. Although born Jewish, the mentalist became a virulent anti-Semite and was enlisted as Hitler's personal clairvoyant, rising to the top echelon of Nazi power. When he caught wind of a secret Nazi plan to torch the Reichstag, the German parliament building, Hannesen made an amazing public prediction. The Reichstag will burn. When it did burn, the public was amazed that Hannesen was right. His fame and influence was short-lived, however. He was eventually murdered by the SS. But controversy and mentalism runs deeper still, largely because of mentalism's close relationship with the spiritualist movement. The churches of spiritualism, spiritualism is a recognized religion, like Catholicism, uh, Lutheranism, that sort of thing. It uh, believes that the dear departed, those who have, have left us, let's be real, those who are dead can actually come back in some sort of form as intelligences, and they can speak through people known as mediums, by means of raps on the table, by means of writing on slates or pieces of paper, by means of uh, taking over the vocal system of the medium and speaking through the medium. There are all manner of beliefs uh, that are practiced. I'd say around the turn of the century, all over the world, especially in England and places like that, people were doing, seances were cr cropping up in, in homes and, 
uh, you know, it was just the thing to do. It was a popular thing to do, to have guests over for dinner, and then now they would close off the windows and the doors, and they would have a seance. Popular mediums like Mina Crandon used nothing more than simple magic tricks, like exuding ectoplasm from her ear as proof of her supernatural abilities. But in time, these fakes were exposed, and their tricks were presented as nothing more than entertainment. Mentalism eventually became another tool in the magician's bag of tricks. Yet even today, mentalism provokes debate. As a result, performers like Peter Ravine are clear to point out to their audience that what they're seeing is magic and not psychic sorcery. I say now, I have never met a person who can read a mind. I can't read a mind. And I've never seen anyone who can, but I'm going to show you how I would go about it if I could read your mind. Then I do mentalism and absolutely blows them away. There's a gentleman who ends his performance by saying, I have used my five senses to produce the illusion of a sixth. Thank you and good evening. Now, that, that takes all the onus off the thing. I mean, uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with a performance like that. The man can appear to be doing a mental act as long as somewhere along the line he says quite clearly that this is not really mental powers. Uh, I have no battle with that kind of a performance, none whatsoever. It's obvious I can't read minds, but then I don't believe anyone can, is one of the things I used to say. But what you'll see in the next few minutes will be the closest single thing you'll ever see to actual mind reading. And then I would go out, and believe it or not, after you're finished, and even though you tell them that you're a fake, you know, that this is just for entertainment purposes, people will come back and they want you to give them private readings, and they really believe this. So it's an area where mysticism still prevail, pervades a great deal. People want that to be true. Peter, just remember the value of this article. Uh, tell them, identify the value test. My sense right now is we got lucky. It's a big bill. I think it's worth $100. Good. $100 bill. Tell them the serial number test. I need Hold you on. to focus on that bill for me, Peter. Really look at it closely. I have a sense of letters. Focus on the letters, Peter. Is the first one an A? Nice yes. Yes? Followed by a J. And then, I believe that's an S. Yes, it is. Good. Keep at it, Peter. Glance at the numbers. We're going to try to do the numbers now. I get quick senses of numbers. Seven jumped out, a five jumped out at me. But want you to go to the very beginning. Oh, I think it actually starts with a seven. That's correct. Four. Right. Zero. That's correct. Five. Yes. Another five. Yes. Seven. Yes. Peter is the last number, a one. Right on. The entire wow. serial number. 100 percent Tessa. Thank you. you Hold on a Good second. Mind While here. Jeff and Tessa don't claim to have supernatural abilities, they keep their minds open to the possibility that there could be something else at work. Well, I think when we first started off, uh, we were using a lot of techniques that we had learned, so it was just all a learned process. And as time moved on, I started, or we both started, discovering that there were certain either objects or certain times in the show that uh, I would suddenly be able to get this information. And I assumed Jeff was concentrating on it or we were using our techniques, and that's how I knew it. And he would say, no, you check after the show. He said, I had no idea what that was. Take a look at this book. Though mentalism is a subject of controversy it. and debate, for Jeff and Tessa, it still remains down. one of magic's most Verifying satisfying the forms. The, the most gratifying thing I get out of being on stage doing the second sight is that the audience has genuinely experienced magic. They mm -hmm. feel that they've experienced something of wonder. Mm -hmm. And I never had that as an illusionist because I did perform magic in the past. What am I touching, Tess? <laughs> I'm not sure what you're touching. Stand up, sir. She's having difficulty with you. Stand up. Well, it's, it's as though there's nothing. Like, nothing's there? <laughs> I got That's it right. incredible, sir. Isn't it amazing? 
He says thanks a lot, Tess. Oh, you're welcome, Gerald. Oh, is your name Gerald? Yes, it is. Is Gerald. it Gerald Bolton? Your last name Bolton. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Give Gerald a round of applause. Mentalism is the one area of magic that people buy as being legitimate still. People really want to believe in mentalism. I don't, you know. I, I believe uh, almost anyone who can do it to a degree of uh, regularity is a fake, a fraud, a phony, and a cheat, but then nobody's perfect. In this age of information, we're all too aware that magic relies upon smoke and mirrors, trap doors, and contraptions. We're so cynical that most of us are unable to watch magic without searching for the secret to the magician's methods. But in mentalist magic, we must give in. The methods are invisible. Even though we know it must be a trick, it nonetheless seems like the mentalist possesses a special power. She got it exactly. It's like mercury, this form of magic. As soon as you try to pin it down, it slips away from you. Is the mentalist someone with special powers or a performer with a specialized bag of tricks? One thing is for certain, it has been around for millennia, and as long as people are anxious to believe, it will continue to fascinate and confound. Is your daughter born April 18th? Right. Thank you very much for saying Can you focus on it for me? I kept seeing green. You gotta keep calm. <laughs> Truth of the matter is, seriously, if you try to lift him now, it's not gonna work. You can try, but there's a distributing of weight, and it just doesn't work. Try, but it just doesn't seem to happen, does it? It's not working. All right, here's what you do. You have the subject in position. The problem and the reason why they could not lift him is that there was not a joining or a harmony of response. They should be able to. So now, gals, here's what I'll do. I'll have you take three deep breaths. On the third breath, as you inhale, I'll say the word lift, and you lift, and he will seem to become so light that you will able to be able to lift him for a few seconds off the chair. And knowing Steve as I do, considering he, he fibbed a little bit on his weight, threw a few pounds more off the side, it's going to be a miracle. All right, now. Comfortable, gals? All right. <laughs> Take the first deep breath, one deep breath. Inhale. Hold it. Now exhale. Take the second deep breath, inhale, hold it, now exhale. Now begin to take the third deep breath and lift. And as you do, they're just lift, 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 if you will, stand as you do. You bring him up into the air, higher, higher, up into the air, high, 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 as light as can be. Slowly, slowly bring him down, slowly, slowly bring him down. Wow.